Welcome to Ask Win Everyone. Today with me I have Dan and so I'm going Dan take it away and explain more about his story and yeah, we're just going to have a natural ep- conversation like we always do. So welcome Dan mm-hmm. and I would have you take it away. Oh, well, thank you, Wynn. And um, I'd like to take it away with just sharing that. I love the name Wynn. Um, it's a first name. And uh, so it's, um, it's great to be on your podcast and um, to be able to share the new Heart for Life story. And, you know, the, the most complex thing in the world, especially with all the information that we all have that we're being bombarded with is really to keep it simple, you know, and to, you know, get to, you know, know, the highlights of the story, but more importantly, you know, what the pivot has been from the New Heart for Life story. And so I'll I'll just share briefly about, you know, some of the background for context and then, um, you know, then shift to really the New Heart for Life theme. which is, it's never too late to change. And um, we all can come overcome adversity. Um, It's possible and certainly you're an example and, you know, myself and thousands of others. So the story of New Heart for Life started at the Veterans Hospital in December of 2012. I went in for a, what they would refer to as a regular or standard a stent procedure, although nothing is standard when you're in a hospital for any procedure. But I went in as, you know, an outpatient. I was expecting to walk out that afternoon about five o'clock, but I was, uh, you know, deemed to be an inpatient for a month and change. And the reason was that during that stent procedure, I um, over underwent a number of heart attacks. I was on blood thinners. I had pneumonia going into that stent procedure, and perhaps that complicated everything, but the cardiologist literally, as it was shared with me later, called up to the head heart surgeon who was teaching a class at the time and said, one of those Houston, we have a problem, you know, type of uh, get down here. And the heart surgeon came down. They ballooned me up to keep me alive that night, and I underwent a nine-hour operation the following day. Uh, they lost me uh, a couple times on the table, and I, after the surgery, they couldn't close my chest because of internal bleeding from the blood thinners. The pneumonia was uh, complicating my oxygen levels, and uh, I was in um, very dire straits, you know, during the operation, obviously, but but afterwards as well. So my recovery um, was a month in that hospital, and I did. Um, through perseverance and grit, grace of God, support and prayers from friends and family, was able to walk out of that veterans hospital uh, late January um, 2013. So I have a question based upon that background knowledge. Why would someone put you under if they knew you had pneumonia going in. I was always told you can't um, be sick, especially now with COVID, um, if you're going to have a major surgery. And so when you say you had pneumonia going into the surgery, Dan, why? Why did they want to do it if you had pneumonia going into it? Yeah, so uh, when that's the same question my uh, four daughters in consultation with the heart surgeon asked, as it's been relayed to me, why did you operate on my dad? Because the heart surgeon said, I never operate or rarely on any patient that either has one of three conditions, pneumonia, as you mentioned, on blood thinners, and recently had heart attack. So I had the trifecta. And the answer to my daughters was, from my surgeon, I had no choice. Uh, your dad was going to die. He had no choice. Your dad was going to die. 
Well, that sounds like a medical malpractice is waiting to happen. Jeez. I mean, it would be one thing if you had pneumonia and then it would be one thing if you contracted pneumonia in the hospital, but going in to a surgery, you um, contracted pneumonia and they still did <laughs> surgery on you even with high risk? Yes, so you're you're right on you're right you're right on point. So you know, for context, um, I went into the stent procedure with pneumonia, which they did not have. The Veterans Affairs did not have. I did say that, you know, I shared that. I believe, but they did not have the records because I went to a private hospital to get diagnosed for that, and they the records they did not have access to those records, and perhaps if they did. Um, and the hospital systems were talking to each other, I, good chance I would never have gone in for the stent procedure. But with, with that said, I did. And, you know, and then after that, you know, my heart surgeon really, you know, as he shared, I mean, he, he didn't have a choice. You know, he was, he took a risk in um, that I would be lost on the table, you know, and not be able to do this interview today. So. Um, I, I, I try not to dwell on that too much. I think things happen for a reason and I just am grateful to be on the other side and be able to share the, the new heart for life story, which is that after, um, a year and a half, you know, I started backsliding into my old habits and then an inner voice came to me and said, Danny, if you don't change your habits and your lifestyle, you've been given a second chance. You're an extra innings you're not going to get another go at this. And it was at, at that time when that I made the decision to live a fit and active life and then went on to um, connect with my passion of running and joined a master's, and that's anybody 50 years or older, track team under a coach, great teammates. Uh, I'm now nationally ranked in the United States uh, for the 200 and 400 meters, and I – am now competing nationally and internationally. And where the story comes together is that that backdrop that we talked about in detail, that just happens to be my story and a lot of adversarial stories are there, but you can come out and there is a process to come through to the point where I really wanna inspire others that um, you can do it, you can win. So that's, that's really the part two and, and the ongoing part of my reason why I believe that I am still here and my purpose in life, to inspire others to, to uh, have a fit and active lifestyle. Now, what is your morning routine? Uh, excuse me, could you repeat that? What is your morning routine? What is my morning looking like? What is your morning routine? Oh, okay. Morning routine. So um, let's see. I am. I spend most of the mornings in um, my endeavor with creating awareness for New Heart for Life. I, I've uh, produced a, um, a video playlist uh, on YouTube. I have a channel on 21 Fitness Principles that I personally um, talk to. They're one word principles, as an example. Accountability is a principle. Intentional is a principle. Um, the last principle is a journey. You know, our lives are a journey. The journey is really the reward. So I've I, uh, been producing those videos. Uh, the playlist is complete it's on YouTube, cha my YouTube channel. I also uh, connect social media with a number of people around the country and world on this topic of overcoming adversity and do uh, podcast um, guest appearances like the one that we're doing today. So that pretty much wraps up <laughs> uh, the morning, maybe even until about two o'clock. And then uh, I get ready and start to um, 
you know, based on the weather conditions, um, go back out and uh, keep fit and active. And although we're not competing right now, everything is, as we all know, is shut down. The practices that I used to have Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays are now they're uh, on the sidelines, but I do keep fit. I do interval training at the track, local track, and I run trails in my local neighborhood. So I'm staying fit and active. And I'm also uh, taken on a, a veteran, of course, you know, being in the veterans hospital, I've taken on the uh, 22 push-up challenge. Uh, and for those listeners that are not familiar with that, that is uh, 22 push-ups a day uh, for aware, creating awareness for veteran suicide prevention. We're losing 22 veterans a day. So I'm actively involved in that. I'm on day 19 right now and also nominating other people that, um, you know, that wish to join uh, in or support, you know, the veteran awareness suicide challenge. And um, for those of you that don't know, because I don't speak about it very often, but I, um, my, I am a granddaughter of a veteran um, on both sides of my family, actually. Um, my grandfather fought in the beaches of Anzio, Italy, and in World War II, mm. and he went back to Harvard um, Business School on the GI Bill. Long story short, he was also in a VA hospital, I believe at one point, Walter Reed, and Walter Reed still to this day, and I have asked people publicly, I because Oprah Winfrey actually did a um, piece on Walter Reed, and at the time before COVID, I was doing something out here locally to me in Aspen, Colorado, with a bunch of vets. And so I happened to ask one of the wives of the veterans, I said, me being a fire in the wall, me being a civilian, me having the um, wherewithal to know, me being uh, only veteran granddaughter, I said to this person, I said, well, is Walter Reed as pretty as Oprah made it out to be, as Oprah and we made it out to be? And she goes, no. And I, mm -hmm. I said, that's what I thought. Because, um, Dan, you just mentioned suicide. Um, we're losing, and I heard you, and I'm going to make you repeat what you said to me. We're losing how many veterans a day to suicide? To 20, an average of 22. Uh, average of 22. And the pandemic certainly isn't helping that. The um, because all of us are getting how do I put it brutally, but honestly, all of us are getting whooped by this pandemic. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with disabilities, veterans included, are getting whooped mm -hmm. by the pandemic, mm -hmm. and it makes me mm -hmm. sad and it makes me break. It literally breaks my heart because of um, we could be doing more to help the veterans, but we're not. Yes, yeah, so I, I I agree, and you know the number could even be trending upwards, and hence the need for this awareness campaign. So it's hashtag twenty two, you know the number twenty two, push up challenge, push up challenge. So if anybody wants to go there and um, participate, that'll, that'll be um, spread the word, create the awareness. And um, it's similar to the ALS um, uh, ice water bucket challenge that, you know, overtook the world, um, I don't know, I think it was 2016. So it's it's got some great yeah. momentum and it's for a great cause. And, 
you know, a shout out to your, your granddads for their service in the military. Well, thank you. And, um, and Dan, if you don't mind me asking, what did you do in the military? Uh, no, not at all. I was, um, I was, I was part of the first lottery. This is one of the lotteries that you don't want to win, win. Ah. <laughs> so does, yep. And it was a lottery where they actually, there's ping pong balls and it would pull them out. And based on your birthday, um, well, you would be your number and your, your chances of being drafted by the local draft board. And, and uh, I, I guess I, I won that one in a you know, weird sense, and I, I entered the uh, the military in 1970, um, and I spent a year in Vietnam, and I spent 18 months in Germany. And, and, I, and you know, to your answer your question, the you know I was fortunate. I signed up. Um, I, I was a computer operator back in the days of. Uh, you know, in the high school is a part-time job. And so I went into computer operations, but that doesn't guarantee you that you're going to be in computer operations. I got to Vietnam. I was fortunate to be in a personnel service company in Benoit, Vietnam. And we had, um, they called it unit record equipment, which is kind of antiquated computers, if you will. And so I was able to, um, although we were, you know, in arm's way, um, I was not out in, 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 the, in the bush, if you will, and, and to all those, I mean, we're all veterans, but for those that are out there, you know, literally putting their lives on the line and dying every day, I was, I was, on the, I was in the support um, side of, uh, of the Army. And you guys may not know this about me, but I, I know exactly what Wadoe Dan was talking about, because my own father came very, very close to be drafted too. And mm. by God's grace, he um, fractured his leg on a motor, in a motorcycle accident and mm. Um, mm. went to the doctor and the doctor goes, there's no way dude, I'm drafting you. So um, in that lottery, in the Vietnam War, they had a lottery, and yes, my dad almost became drafted. And, and mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. grandfather went, and he fought World War II. And so, mm -hmm. yes, I know that lottery you were talking about, and they don't okay. <laughs> have that lottery anymore, you guys. But in the 60s and 70s, oh, yes, yeah. they did. Yeah. And my dad came very, very, very close. And that is something mm. I, don't, I don't talk about. But my mm. um, connections to the Army and the Navy and the Air Force are very, mm. very strong because mm. uh, both my, well, my man and my grandfather but then um, if my dad went in, he would have been uh, on me bed too. Hmm. A lot of connections between you and I, Win. And I'm gonna, let me ask you in terms of, you mentioned Walter Reed earlier in our interview. Were you yeah. re referring to the Walter Reed Hospital right outside uh, of Washington or in yeah. Washington, D.C.? I am. I am. We yeah. saw yeah, so there's a uh, there's a connection there. So that and I think through the days of Oprah and that hospital really was you know <laughs> torn down. That you know veterans are coming back and yeah. it was really a public relations hot mess. And since yeah, then they now have combined. I was born. My dad was a Navy officer for 30 years, and I was born at the Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland, which is now you know to connect all the dots now is the Walter Reed Medical Center. And it's located in Bethesda, Maryland. And of course, throughout the last years and since that awareness from, from Oprah and other celebrities, um, it's now a, you just, you know, a, um, they've taken the best practices of, of all hospitals. And, and that's uh, actually right in my neighborhood and born in Bethesda. It was Bethesda Naval Hospital at the time. So there's, yeah. there's a, 
there's a lot of a lot of connections between you I and our parents and grandparents. Past because um, I um, I don't talk about that very much, but I figured I should. But um, if then if your best friend had to write a book about you, um, what would the title be? Uh, I would have to say that it would be, it's never too late to change. And, you know, of course, a new art, heart for life story would be part of that book. Um, but also, I just, and this is a, a message um, and a legacy that I feel proud of leaving. We talked about going to Vietnam in 1970. Well, my college education was interrupted. I mean, I was at the University of Maryland, but University of Maryland became Bin Laden, Vietnam. So I did try to go back, you know, on several times, you know, and I did pick up some credits, but I can proudly share that last month I received my degree of this um, Bachelor of Science in Business uh, with honors from the University of Phoenix. We had Larry Fitzgerald as our keynote speaker virtual event. And so it took me 50 years to finally complete my degree. And I think it's never too late, you know, to change and stay with it, stay persistent, and uh, keep your eye on the goal. And um, it's the journey, not the reward. But my mother always wanted me to get a college degree. And that certainly was, as Larry Fitzgerald's mother <laughs> always wanted him to get a degree. Uh, that was a major, major um, motivator for me. So I use and talk about, you know, overcoming heart surgery and what we talked about and being a master's track nationally ranked athlete. But also, you know, the other highlight is the college degree. So it's never too late to change, I believe, would be the book title. No, it's never too late to change. And what is your favorite book? Uh, well, it's an easy, well, it's an easy question. I don't, I'm not an avid reader, um, but at the 2019 senior old games uh, for, again, Masters in Albuquerque, New Mexico last year, I was, I had the pleasure of meeting and having uh, the you know, seminar that was presented by an organization called Growing Boulder. And uh, my, Favorite book is by Mark Middleton, and it's called Growing Boulder. And his his theme is something that you know I just really embrace, and and I just love the concepts. But they Mark breaks it down into growing bolder, not older. And when people ask me about fitness, and like, well, Dan, I'm too old, I, you know, I'm too tired, I've got this, I've got that. I mean, we all have to meet fitness wherever we're at. You know, I mean, you know. I'm not advocating people go out and run master's track. You have to check with your doctor and do what's appropriate. But I always say back to them, and this, you know, was brought out in the book. Well, it's a choice. And the choice is, as Mark Middleton often says, do you want, is, is it, you have a choice between motion or medicine. And that theme in the redefining of ageism and that what we thought, you know, back in the day of what it would be like to be a 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 year old has changed. I'm 71 years old, just turned 71. Uh, at Albuquerque um, at that National Senior Games, there was, and any, anybody listening can Google it. Her name is Julia Hurricane Hawkins, 103 years young running the 100 meter dash. So excuse Growing me. Boulder is my my favorite book. Excuse me, 100 and <laughs> 103. She might be 104 right now. She was 103 when I met her last year in in Albuquerque. And oh. she is her cheesy she's got rosy cheeks. Uh you just google it and uh she's she's there's many, you know, she's one. But there's, uh, she's not alone in terms of 100-year-olds that uh, are in master's track. And, and that's really the point of the book, that what we think of uh, what a 100-year-old ought to be, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 
year olds, um, you know, we're, we're changing that with fitness and health and, and active lifestyles. Yeah, exactly. Active lifestyles. Um, yeah, we're changing that as we speak. Considering that the pandemic is, um, as I said, given, given us all a new perspective on life, and those mm -hmm. of us who are still alive, thank you very much. And I'm not putting mm -hmm. that highly, um, have a new perspective on life. It does. And when, if I could ask a question of you, um, yeah. just in terms of my interest in, in your story, um, how did your journey lead you to overcoming your adversities? Oh, jeez. Where do I start? I give the I will <laughs> quick version, um, and I could I could and should have been. Today is August tenth, as we're recording this. I August twelfth. Um, I mm -hmm. mean to say August. Today is August twelfth, as we're recording this. I should have been and could have been on the ground. Basically, mm. today, um, today marks the 10 year anniversary of me losing my mom to a mm. leaking mm. brain aneurysm. And, um, but I, because I experienced the deaths of one parent at such a young age, 23, it's um, not the best age to experience loss of your mother. And then at 32, I experienced loss of my dad. So mm -hmm. in the time of a 10 year span, they both um, passed. And so I had to grow up quite quickly and I had to figure out my own situation with help quick. I, yeah, I, if one situation doesn't bring me down and mm. the other situation didn't bring me down, geez, if that's not a story right there. I don't know what is mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I um I am sitting here today knowing that I will never be alone. I will always mm -hmm. have support and it just dawned on me this morning that I will never be alone. I will always mm -hmm. have Support, but at the same time, I will never get my parents back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, um, when you talk parents, um, you're talking about, you know, a spiritual connection in my beliefs that, you know, it's part of you is missing. And you know, for those that have lost parents, um, certainly with my mom, was I lost her early. And I, I just remember, and I'm sure you've experienced it as well, um, you know, that hole, you know, that emptiness. And so losing your parents, they're, they're, they're not just your parents, they're, they're, they're really spiritually part of who you are. And it, it does take time to overcome. And then when you get the, you know, you know, 10 years later, then you have to, you know, face it again and experience it again so well um, yeah, and um the day my mom died she was supposed to be transferred up to a rehab for to start recovering from a soul leaking brain aneurysm and she mm, quite mm. laid out of medical malpractice and my dad mm. knew it as he was mm. dying, and he died of a medical malpractice too, 
long mm. going for mm. a while. And um and so but all in all when you um start thinking about it and to swing it back to the veterans and then I'm going to let you ask me those questions you wanted to ask me. All in all, when you are um, talking to a veteran who's older, you should be calling um, with the busting office. You should be calling their conversations because we're losing these veterans, Vietnam War veterans, left, right, and center. I mean, I have a dear friend mm. who is a Vietnam War veteran, and yeah. Um, I figured that one out many, many years ago. I asked, I asked his wife once. I point blank. I said, "Why would your ex-husband be saying stuff to me out in public?" Straight. I love this guy dearly, but he is a little bit strange because of Vietnam. And my yeah. Yeah. Uh, his wife goes, you know that he's a Vietnam War veteran, and I'm like, mm. okay, that makes complete yeah. bingo. Sense. Right. Bingo, and I'm like, when I uh, when I when she told me that, I'm like, okay, now <laughs> back up, yeah. back up, back up, back up, and apologize because. Um, the Vietnam War veterans and the World War II veterans and mm -hmm. the um, Afghanistan veterans mm -hmm. and everyone else in between, but especially yep. the Vietnam, they got, they, I don't know how to put it nicely, they got shit kicked because yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. they, Number one, Agent Orange. Number two, um, and for those of you that don't know about Agent Orange, Agent Orange is what mm. they call bugs with, and they use it towards people in Vietnam. Mm. And so, mm -hmm. number one, Agent Orange. Number two, by the time that these guys got home, they mm. um, went welcome home in the way that I would like to see. Now, um, mm -hmm. with the beaches of Anzio and Italy and World War II, we got a little bit better, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Hey, Wed, to your uh, point about veterans and, you know, your you know, your observation and your aha moment of, oh, okay, PTSD. Uh, I was having a Zoom call with our, we have family Zoom calls every every two weeks. And I have a cousin um, who also served in Vietnam around the same time I did and not that far from where I was located. And somehow we came across the topic of Vietnam, he and I, during the Zoom call. And he mentioned that uh, he during fireworks, 4th of July, and I've never really shared this with anyone, you know, and thinking, you know, we kind of, I dismissed it. I mean, you know, my family and close ones um, understand it. But he said that during fireworks, he gets really skittish. And I said, Billy, you know, I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I, I hide at 4th of July. And the reason is, you know, rock and the Viet Cong used to use rockets and they had a whistling sound and, yeah. you know, they would go, I mean, I was on a support base, but their main target was the Benoit airstrip. So they would send rockets across our compound trying to, you know, destroy the airstrip. And, you know, a lot of them would misfire, right? And they'd short, fall short of the target and, you know, land in our compound. So anytime I hear fireworks and so BS, PTSD, can be, you know, different gradations, and um, and I share that because it, you reminded me of it with with your story of, of your colleague, and so it's uh, it's a phenomena that has, um, you know, that 
affects us. I mean, and to a degree, I have, I have PTSD. I never thought I really did, but in a sense, I do in terms of comparing notes with my, uh, my cousin, Billy Quinn. And uh, he lives in a place called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. <laughs> oh, oh, truth. Well, there we go. Um, and Dan, do you have any questions, any more questions for me? Well, the you know you, you shared the, your journey about losing your parents, you know, in ten year intervals. Um, just in terms of overcoming adversity yourself, personally, um, I'd love to learn more about you know your you know your obstacles and your 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 you've got books that you've written, you know, you've got this podcast, you're doing speaking engagements, you're out there in the public sharing your message and inspiring others. So I'd, I'd love to learn just a little bit more insight in terms of your obstacles and, and any, you know, like a takeaway on, you can leave with myself and, and your audience on how you overcame, you know, the cards that you were dealt. Well, <laughs> and this is going to sound um, cliche, but I was given the win-win attitude in um, 87. And yes, for those of you who are new to this podcast and new to my story, Win is my legal name. And of course, every, every time I hear it transcribed, it comes on Lynn, which doesn't surprise me at all. And Dan, mm -hmm. um, said before we got on this call is this Kelly and people mm. people mm. land up calling me Kelly um half the time and it drives me nuts because um no I have a really good friend and the first first time she met me which was um which was only last year she stands there I'm in my walker and she um, stands there and looks at me, and I didn't I didn't know her very well. I, I knew in a bed bedded capacity now than I knew her then. But she goes, "Hi, Lynn," and I'm like, "Oh boy, here we go." And then I, mm -hmm. uh, and then I, we went on about uh meeting and it's like oh boy okay and then uh and then as um we we as individuals got closer i um she i still tease it to this day and she's like okay now i can now i can get the straight facts that lynn is not your name and I'm like, mm. yeah, okay. And this is when we were, um, this is before COVID and when we were allowed to go out and see people. And so it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and so a lot of people land up calling me by a name that is not my name because they don't understand that when is my legal name? And they, you spell it as in win a game. So mm -hmm. I have to literally, and I had to do this with this person. I literally have to say win, W-I-N. And it makes me sound like a true dumb dumb because I literally mm. have to spell my name out. And oh. Mm. And of course, and of course, it just literally makes me sound like a dumb and dumb when I spell my name out because people, for them to get the concept of, okay, I'm meeting a win and I'm meeting a win and I'm going mm. to be help mm. a winner, no pun mm. intended. But um, it literally makes me sound so dumb that it's just it's well just, 
Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you a little. I'll give you a little tip. I'll give you a little tip on that. That will yes. hopefully allow you not to feel. Or so it's a, such. A, it's not such an awkward moment. Dale Carnegie. You ask about books. And yeah, my all-time favorite book is How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. By Dale Carnegie. That, that I mean that is the, the the bedrock of of relationships. And in his book, he says. The sweetest sound to anyone's ears is their name. Make sure you get it right. So it's important. And, I you know, you have it. a name that you need I clarification on. I so love it. I love it. I love don't, it. And so, yeah, don't feel dumb. It's, it's um, uh, you mispronounce the name and, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's uh, relationship changes. Now, let me ask you a quick question on, on your name. Is it, um, is it a nickname or is it? Did it come from Winfrey or any deviation uh, of? It came from my paternal grandmother on my mom's side. Um, her legal name was Pauline Winifred. She uh, gave up the Pauline. I didn't um, realize that until after she died that it hmm. was actually Pauline Winifred. I always thought it was Winifred Pauline backwards, but um, I she decided that Winifred was too old for her liking, mm. so she mm. just um, shortened it to Win, and ever since then it stuck. So I was given my name by my mother, but she got um, the inspiration from her biological mom. That's a great story. And it's something that's a badge of honor, I think, you know, and, oh. you know, and each time, I don't know, I mean, it, you, you handle it, you know, gracefully. You did with me when I first started oh, talking to you before yeah. our interview here. Yeah, I have. You know, it's like, I have to handle it. I have to handle it. Like, yeah. I've, got, I've gotten that so many times in my life. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've gotten that so many. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great conversation starter. It's a great yeah. icebreaker, as we say. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a great icebreaker. And um, Al Davis of the Ethelin Raiders, and this is a tag I use all the time in LA, L. Davis of the Ethelin Raiders at the time, said, just win, baby. And so that's a tag line. Yeah, yeah. If, um, if, that's, yeah. Um, if that doesn't set people straight in their tracks, I don't know what will, but uh, it's... Just win, just win, win, baby, right. Coming mm -hmm. to find out, what I'm coming to find out is legally you can name your child anything you want. I'm like, okay, that's, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy, oh boy, more unique name clubs coming out of COVID. And I mark my words when I say this, um, there's going to be a baby boom at the oh. end of COVID or in the middle of COVID because um, people have, people can't do what they have to do. And so I know, I know several um, people in my own life slash on YouTube who now have kids mm. because um, mm. so if, if you're not getting and I don't want to put this my life, but if you're not getting sickened by COVID, just think about the next generation who's coming in to, uh, yeah. who's coming in at a time that will change everyone's life. Yes, yes. I didn't realize, um, well, you know, what, one of the things that maybe through these interviews and you know your popular popularity throughout COVID. You know we may have you. You might not hold on that uniqueness 
you know, there might be other win, yeah. win babies that uh, are named. Yeah. Um, you know, just so if, if you have a minute, just it's interesting how we can talk about names and it spurs just memories. My name, my dad's name is Daniel Nicholas Williams, right? And, you know, I'm, you know, I've got three sisters. I'm the only son. And so when I was born, of course, I was Daniel Nicholas Williams. But my dad, you know, um, and you know about military, right? He goes, my son is not going to be named Junior, right? You know, he's, I'm not going to have a Junior. And that's typically what happens when you're, you're, yeah. you're the named uh, son. And so he put on my birth certificate the second, right? So um, not anything near as unique as you, but I'm I'm Daniel Nicholas Williams the second, and re there's really no seconds. There's you go to um, junior, and then you go to the third. So yeah. um, maybe, maybe we share a little bit uniqueness in in our names as well. Although yeah, that, uh, I, that, think, I, I think I think you got you got me on on the on, huh, on the, the win name. That's interesting. And so Dan, where can people find you, and where can people get a hold of you if they want to get a hold of you? Yeah, so it's it's um, all they have to do is go to um, http colon slash slash um, newhart n e w h e a r t newhart the number four life newhartforlife dot com uh, if you put in newhart for f o r life dot com talking about names uh, you'll get to the same place and then on there there are uh, multiple links. Um, my 21 fitness principles, uh, the story from American Heart Association about the New Heart for Life story. Uh, we have um, interviews. Uh, the interview that, like, similar to ones that we're doing right now, will be up on that site. And then, you know, anybody is free. There's at the you know contact information at the bottom if they'd like to get in contact with me at newheartforlife at gmail.com. Again, the number four, newheartforlife at gmail.com. And uh, I'm in a mission, and just similar to yourself in terms of paying it forward, and um, encourage anybody all the information. Take a look at those 21 fitness principles, and uh, I'd appreciate any feedback, uh, comments, suggestions, and how they may have helped you in in your journey. Yeah, well, I'm also on a mission, um, not only to raise cerebral palsy awareness, but I. I'm also on a mission to raise all disability awareness, including mental health, including mm -hmm. organ failure, including organ transplants, the list goes on and on and on. And mm -hmm. so I am on a mission to raise awareness on all disability fronts. And yeah, I'm slowly but slowly getting my journalism degree, you guys, and you guys know that, and I truly appreciate you guys supporting this, and I'm truly appreciative of Dan coming on and sharing this story, and I hope you guys enjoyed another fabulous episode. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>